All right. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, good. You can, you know what? We're going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 17. Luke 17. All right. Right. So I want to first say good morning to all of you. It's a blessing to be in the Lord's house this morning. And if you're visiting for the first time, I want to welcome you. My name is Pastor Timothy Robinson. Uh, I hope your experience has been so far uh, very inviting. Uh, we we want to get to know you, and we're actually going to continue to keep worshiping together, actually in the fellowship hall after this, where we can you can go there, get coffee, get snacks, whatever it is, just really just get to know each other. And then the fellowship doesn't stop there. Oh, it keeps going. We're going to actually continue to fellowship in the week, because guess what starts this week? It's life groups. Amen. That's right. You are in a life group commercial right now. It's about to happen. <laughs> I hope you're ready. You didn't even know that it was about to happen, did you? But seriously, um, we have life groups starting and we have a Tuesday night, we have a Wednesday daytime, and we have two Friday sessions. And so if you're interested in joining life group and you missed the sign up, guess what? There's still time for you to sign up. There's still some of the classes have rooms left for you to sign up next week and or yeah, definitely next week. Whenever we can get the online situation working, you'll be able to actually sign up for life groups from online. And we're actually going to open that up to the public as well. So I am really, really excited about life groups. Um, but if this is your first time and you picked a, a really good time to be with us, because we are going to be starting a two part series on Thanksgiving and we've titled it Thanksgiving matters. Thanksgiving matters. And all the stomachs in here said amen, right? <laughs> amen. Thanksgiving matters. I had a, a funny situation happen to me. Um, my mom and my parents are coming down for Thanksgiving. And, and um, so I'm just, I just, I'm so used to being with my mom and doing Thanksgiving that she actually cooks. And so I don't know what I was doing. I was talking to my mom and I was just like, yeah, make sure you make this. And my wife's like, you know, oh, oh your mom's cooking? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, she's cooking, of course, and she's going to make me some greens and all this stuff. And she, I just didn't notice that she was really getting, like, really, really angry. And I was just, and she's just like, Look, why would your mother come all the way to Virginia to cook? You have a problem with my cooking? I'm like, whoa, I'm just thinking about macaroni and cheese. I'm not even <laughs> thinking about any of this stuff that you're thinking about. So I survived. I'm here this morning. I apologize to my wife. My wife is going to be cooking. It's going to be delicious. I'm going to love it. I'm going to eat all of it. All right? So that's what's, that's what's going on with that. But, um... We know that um, Thanksgiving holidays and even some of our words have, have lost their historical meanings, uh, particularly Thanksgiving. We know, thanks, so historically we know Thanksgiving. Uh, we have 103 pilgrims with William Bradford uh, getting on the Mayflower, coming to Cape Cod and actually experiencing the worst. Uh, the, the, what was it? Yes, coming to Plymouth and, and experiencing the worst uh, winter they've ever experienced ever. Actually, only 52 people actually survived that winter. Um, 18 of the married women that were on there, only, f um, actually there was 18 women, 14 of them actually passed away. So there's only 52 people that was left. It was very, very, very devastating. So many people dying for the next generation. And, and when we look at the pictures on TV and we think about Thanksgiving, or sometimes how it's taught in school, it's like all this abundance. You've seen the pictures where there's the Indians and there's pilgrims and there's all this abundance and there's food everywhere. And, and when you really look at the story, um, they're not, the first Thanksgiving wasn't about abundance of prosperity. It was really about perseverance. Most of the pilgrims were Christians and they were, they were during their time of trial, they were thinking about Israel and thinking about how during Israel's time of trials, they would stay faithful to the Lord. And so they continued to stay faithful to the Lord. And so it was completely about perseverance, not prosperity. And so, um, and they were also thankful, you know, they, they had an interpreter now, they could speak to the Indians, they actually had corn and, and all of these things. So they were very, very thankful. And of course, we've lost that. Of course, we've lost that. Today, Thanksgiving is typically and mostly about the food. And it's also about gathering family together. But it, and it's also even still about giving thanks, but it's definitely uh, um, not attached to giving thanks to God, giving thanks to God. 
It has actually become a tip, like a time for us that we can actually step out of reality and kind of just practice this uh, moral kind of ethic of giving thanks. And so we, what we say down south is if you don't really feel something, you give lip service to it. And so many of us during this time, we give lip service to the thought of thanksgiving because most of the, the year, we've been unthankful. We've been unsatisfied with life. That's really been our, our mode, anxiety and coveting describes how most of the year, or for some of us, even our years have been. Unthankfulness is the mode that we've been in. And sometimes, and for many of us during this time, Thanksgiving is really irritating because you have to pretend to be someone you're not. You're not thankful, right? And the only reason you want to be thankful is because our culture, we don't like people who are ungrateful. Culture, culture doesn't like that, and we don't want people to think that we're ungrateful. And here's what's really disturbing about being driven by culture and not by our hearts for God. Culture tells us that we should be thankful, but yet culture also reminds us that we should want more and more and more. And so what's going to be happening this week and, and next week is you're going to see lots of commercials about family coming together, joining and, and standing around the table saying what they're thankful for. And then right after that, you're going to have a commercial about the Black Friday sales. Are you, are you not? Right after that. And then what I experienced last Thanksgiving, I believe it was last Thanksgiving, was uh, on Black Friday sales started on Thursday. They started at 6 p.m. And so we had family members leaving Thanksgiving to go buy more stuff after we stood around and said how thankful we were. God's people, and it's not just a them, a them thing, it's a God's people thing. God's people are not exempt from this. We are also unthankful. We have a history of being unthankful as God's people. If you remember Israel, after they're saved from Egypt, they're taken into the, uh, the desert and, and they're complaining. They're complaining the whole way there. And so they're complaining that they want food. And so God, what does he do? He gives them manna. And so when you get to the book of Numbers, Numbers 11, they're still complaining, but this time they want meat. And what does God say? God says, you know what? I'm going to give you so much meat that's going to come out of your nose. That's, that's, that's what it says. And he continues to say, because you are an ungrateful people. You're an ungrateful people. Thanksgiving matters. And so when I say Thanksgiving matters, what I'm, what I'm trying to, to, to say is that we were created for Thanksgiving. And so God cares if we are thankful. We were created for Thanksgiving, and so God cares a lot, whether or not we are thankful. We're going to be looking at Luke 17. This story here tells us a lot about uh, thankfulness. We're going to be in Luke 17, uh, verse 11, going to 19. This uh, narrative, it's a narrative, and so I'm going to teach it as a narrative, um, but it, there are a lot, it has a deeper meaning than just a healing. This is just an episode of healing, but it has a lot of deeper meaning than that and implies to thankfulness and, and how God cares about thankfulness. So I'm going to be jumping kind of out of, out of the, 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 the rhythm of this and jumping back in uh, nevertheless, but um, we're still going to be here and still be looking at uh, thankfulness from Luke 17, starting with verse 11. Luke 17, starting with verse 11, and we're going to go down to verse 19. When he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him, and they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now, one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, saying, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God? Except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you are a loving and kind God and you do not give us what we deserve for our unthankfulness. Um, Lord, we pray that we will learn to be thankful for what you have done for us and thankful for the things to come, to keep those things at the center of our minds. Um, pray that we, during this time, would teach others as well to be thankful towards you. 
as the opportunities come, as we have families sitting around our tables and conversations about thankfulness arises, Lord. Uh, give us the words and, and remind us to, to see these as opportunities to give glory to you. I ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. So it is believed that this event actually happens after Jesus has just healed Lazarus. So he goes a, a different route to a, a avoid the authorities who are seeking to kill him. And he comes across these 10 men who are suffering with the disease of leprosy. These 10 men, they see Jesus and they cry out for mercy. And the Lord tells them to go see the priests. The priests could declare these men clean or unclean. And as they went, the text tells us that they were healed. They were healed as they went. They were healed after they obeyed. And then verse 9 says that of them, the men could, most of the nine of the men continued, sorry, nine of the men continued on to the priest, but only one of them actually turned around glorifying God. And this man was actually a Samaritan. And he comes back to God. He glorifies God. He's falling at his feet and he's giving him thanks. Look at verse 17. It says, then Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner. Jesus is astonished by their lack of gratitude. Have you ever held the door for someone and they said thank you? Has anyone ever done that? Men? You better raise your hand, men. You know that? No one? No one's ever done that? Okay. It's not a New England thing. That's cool. Um, um, so let's say you, you, you open the door for someone, they say thank you. You're not shocked by that, right? That's just our culture, right? We, we, we expect people uh, to say thank you when we hold the door open for them. You are shocked when someone does not open the door for you. And I will also say, unless you live in New England, because no one actually says thank you for that right around here. But typically, if you're, you're, typically, you are very shocked if someone doesn't say thank you. I believe that it's shocking to us because ingrained in us, is the, in our DNA, is this, is this idea that people should be thankful, especially thankful to us. Now, because of the sin of pride, we are harder on others than we are on ourselves about being thankful. And I say pride because we shouldn't be shocked that others are not thankful. We shouldn't be shocked about that because no one owes us anything. We shouldn't expect thankfulness because we aren't the creators of all things. God is. And so like a parent that mourns for a child that has determined to go a wrong path, we see Jesus here, here he's hurt and he's baffled, he's sorrowful, that his creation is not walking in their purpose. Jesus asked the same question he asked in the Garden of Eden. Where are they? You see, mankind was created for thanksgiving. So right off the bat, the word of God is clear about the purpose of our purpose on this earth. Christianity is one of the religions that we do not run from the question, what is the purpose of life? Why are we here? It is the Christian belief that you will not even experience life until you understand your purpose. The word of God gives us our purpose, particularly in Isaiah 43, 7. It says, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Who we are, we are called by his name. And what is our purpose? We are created to glorify God. Now, we say that all the time, glorify God. What does that actually mean? One of my favorite um, definitions of, of, of the glory of God comes from John Piper. It says, the glory of God is the beauty and excellence of his manifold perfections. It is an attempt to put into words what God is like in his purity. God's glory is the perfect harmony of all his attributes. So what Isaiah 43 is saying is that God created us so not that he could be more glorious. We didn't bring more glory to God. He was already fully glorious, fully holy. What Isaiah 43 is saying is that God created us so his glory would be known and praised throughout the earth. That we who belong to him would see his glory and praise him in awe and be thankful for him. So how do we do that? How do we spread the glory of God? Well, the book of Psalm gives us some, Psalms gives us some insight into this question. Two verses. Two verses. Psalms 50, 23. 
He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. Some of your Bibles may say acknowledges me. It says he who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. So glorifying God is speaking thanksgiving about him. And and yet glorifying God has to be more than that because we just said from the beginning that you can give lip service to thanking God, but it it cannot, it could be in your heart, not really there. You can talk about Thanksgiving, but, but not really actually experience it. So it has to be more than just lip service. And so when we get to Psalm 51, 16 through 17, it says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a, a broken and a contrite heart. So if we put it, just put it all together, what, what, what we learn here is we were created to glorify God through thanksgiving from our hearts because out of the heart one speaks. We were created for thanksgiving. You see, Adam and Eve, when we, we come across them in the garden before chapter three, what we come across is two humans who are fully satisfied in God alone. Now, how do we know this? How do we know that Adam and Eve are fully satisfied in God alone? Here's why. Because Adam and Eve, they never disobey God and eat from the tree on their own. They walk past this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They walk past it every day. Yet they are also walking with God. They are in awe of him and thankful. They're, they're, they honor him and, and their thankfulness, what it does, it produces in them obedience. It produces in them obedience. When we are satisfied in something, what happens? We honor it. We acknowledge it. We praise it. And then the natural response to that is obedience. This is how we know that Adam and Eve were fully satisfied in God. And so when we look at chapters one and two of Adam and Eve, what we're seeing is how we are supposed to be walking, how we are supposed to be walking in thankfulness towards our creator. But of course, the fall happens. Look at verse 12 in our text. It says, as he entered a village, this is Jesus, he comes across 10 men who have leprosy, who stood at a distance Leprosy was one of the diseases that you had. If you had it, you had to live outside the camp. You had to stand at a distance. And if you came into a establishment or if you came into a city, what you had to do was say, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. So you had to scream that out really loud. Imagine having to scream, I'm unclean, I'm unclean every time you enter a place. These people were social rejects. No one wanted to be around them. Leprosy, what it did was it distanced these men from society, and in this case, it distanced them from God. Leprosy in the Bible is a picture of sin and its effects. You see, sin actually separates us from God, and it also separates us from each other. And so what Satan does is he causes Adam and Eve to sin by tempting them with unthankfulness. You see, Satan was unthankful. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't satisfied with his position that God had given him. He wanted more. He wanted to be like God. And as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, what we get is the effects of that unthankfulness. The Apostle Paul, what he does is he gives us this breakdown of mankind in Romans 1, but really my, my favorite, almost my favorite chapter in the Bible because it makes sense of what in the world is going on here. He just really breaks down our history. And here's what he says in Romans 1.21. He says, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him. There's that word honor. They did not honor him, acknowledge him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. And so what we see in the garden is we go from, from being called by God's name. And when we get to Genesis 11, what are we trying to do? We're trying to build the Tower of Babel. And what are we trying to do? Make a name for ourselves. We go from being satisfied in God alone to wanting more and actually demanding it. We go from walking with God to hiding from God. Jesus screaming to Adam and Eve, where are you? As he screams, where are they to these men? We go from walking with God to like these men with leprosy separated from God, having to stand at a distance from God. And we go from children of God to enemies who need mercy, just like these men need mercy here. 
And from this point on, human beings are born with just this desire of joy, which is a good thing. Like, I'm not against joy, but because of sin, man, we see joy in everything. And no matter how much stuff we collect and no matter how much stuff or, that we have or how many friends we have or, or how many uh, uh, comp- like compliments that we get, it's never going to be enough. It's like coming across the perfect swimming pool. That's the perfect temperature, just how you like it. And it's, and it's overlooking mountains. It's just a beautiful view. When you jump in, you feel refreshed and you, you, pl- you plan on staying there for a long time. But then the pool starts to drain and you find yourself in this empty, dirty pool. And when you get back out, it, it fills back up and you do it all over again. That is mankind's story trying to find joy in things that will not last. So what's at stake? Proverbs 3, 6 tells us, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So those who honor him and are thankful, he is involved in our our steps in this life. He cares how we move. He cares how we walk because the way we walk, if we're walking in our purpose, we are supposed to be displaying the glory of God all over the earth. You know, Romans 10, 15, what does it say? It says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But when we are unthankful towards God, What's at stake is an entire life on a path for joy that leads to destruction. Thinking back back to Romans 1, unthankfulness leads to God actually giving us what we want. Romans 1.21 says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, to give him honor, to be thankful towards him, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. What's at stake is that un- unthankfulness can destroy a soul, but it can also destroy a society. As we see Adam and Eve, as soon as sin enters, what, is, what happens? They turn on each other. Romans 1 shows that unthankfulness to God leads to men and women saying, sex between man and woman is not good enough. We want more. And homosexuality enters And not just homosexuality, malice, strife, inventors of evil, faithless, heartless, ruthless is what the text says. All of this coming from unthankfulness. How many funerals did you go to last year? Because of unthankfulness, sin entered. So you have to understand, Christian, when you are ungrateful, you're not just having a moment. You're not just having a bad day. The serpent has your ear. You are not walking in your purpose. So I wanna finish by telling you why we should be thankful and how we are to be thankful. Number one, why we should be thankful. Besides the point that we were created to be thankful, we should be thankful because of the glory of God. 